take somebody's hand if you will stretch across the aisles and leave no one untouched a little more monitored sound man if you will certainly we can look at our ecological systems and realize that the Bible is right there were certain things happening ecologically, geopolitically that indicate that things are moving and shifting. And if there's ever a time that we need to get close to God, surely that time is now. Amen. Not only for our material and our physical existence, but we have to give some consideration to the fact that none of us will be here forever. And I'm a little worried about the conditions that will exist for my grandchildren, for my spiritual grandchildren and my natural grandchildren, because so much is shifting. And you cannot only live for right now, you've got to think of eternity. Somehow, when you think of eternity, you can handle life better here. And hey, give some thought before I pray. If God can bless you through eternity, why are you in a hurry now? Squeeze those hands so gently. Father, we come in the name of Jesus. We honor you. We exult. We exalt. We sublimate. We lift up. We macrograph your holy name. And as we're touching somebody, we pray right now that we're touching somebody who's touching you. And if they're touching you, then the battle is already won. The victory is already ours. And we declare it in the name of Jesus. And you told us that no weapon formed against us would prosper. And we receive that right now that everything Satan has planned for us will go bankrupt and we claim it and we declare it and we put our foot on it right now in the name of Jesus everything that's been formed against my brother my sister I pray you tear it down right now every appointment that Satan has made cancel it right now cancel my appointment with the Antichrist cancel my appointment with the demon powers and spirits and I pray now that every child of God will have the victory and I speak it done in the name of Jesus bless the hands I hold deliver the hands I hold strengthen the hands I hold lift the hands I hold and I speak it in the name of Jesus and if you believe God lose those hands give God the glory Give God the praise. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord and surely we honor the Lord tonight. We are particularly grateful that he has brought us to this place, to this wonderful house of the Lord under the auspicious leadership of the prophet E.J. Newton. Give God a praise for your leader, your pastor, and for prophetess Dorian. Amen. We thank God for her and the family. And certainly we are very grateful to see uh, my son, the prophet Passion Java. Amen to Prophet Innocent. Amen, uh, you know, sons, grandsons, all kind of relationships. We thank God for the Bishop Clement, well, Pastor Clement James. <laughs> and of course, to the Bishop Odell James. We thank God for them coming to be with us and to all of my fellow yoke servants in the vineyard, to this extraordinary band, 
I hope somebody in this band can follow me tonight. Amen. To the melodious and euphonious singers and, and of course, prophetess. Oh, we thank God for you being here. Uh, Bishop, that's wonderful for you being here. And uh, I, I got married last year, so I brought my wife with me. Amen. Loretta Jones. Amen. We thank God for her. And all of a sudden now, I've got to leave here, go to New York, from New York to St. Louis. I'm not 37. Uh, and then uh, Ghana and, uh, and from Ghana to South Africa and back home and, and all of that stuff. And uh, I think it's because when I got married, I did Deuteronomy 24 and 5. <laughs> Do you know what that says? Deuteronomy 24 and 5. Look at it real quick. Find it. You got it there. You know, you got these machines. Do you have a flat table? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think I, you think I can manage that? Let's see. My hope is built. See, now you can't find me on the key, can you? Oh, he has to find me and then, oh no, I'm not gonna sing, I'm just teasing you. But maybe I should though. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweet refrain, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground, sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. I should give God praise for the melodious, euphonious singers that I heard. And amen. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. And it, uh, it's just marvelous to come into a building and, and hear the children of God praising God and giving God praise on a level that indicates that their joy is full. So we thank God for that. Now, when it comes to leadership, we understand that we're living in a time when things are changing. And one of the things about mentoring young people One of the things about mentoring young people is when you mentor in order for your shelf life to be extended. You see, at my age, I'm passing out of the contemporary environment that you are a part of. And God never leaves himself without a witness. So whenever someone is passing out of that contemporary environment that they are not optimum in. My optimum was maybe 20 years ago, but I'm passing out of the environment because I'm a baby boomer and the baby boomers and the exes are passing out. And now we've got the Gen Z's and well, the millennials and the Gen Z. And that's a whole nother kind of intellectual cognitive energy that is going to play in today's time. And it is the way it has always been. Everything and everybody has an expiration date. The significant thing for me then is to mentor people who are optimum within the parameters of their social environment, cultural environment, intellectual environment, and spiritual environment. So as I give them sage old wisdom, I listen for the contemporary connection. So what that does is it brings me closer to your generation through their eyes. Make sense? So what that does is it extends 
my shelf life. So that instead of just simply dealing with baby boomers and dealing with excess, I can invade the lives of the Gen Zs and the millennials. But you have to journey with me tonight and I want you to give God great thanks for your pastor, your leader. Amen. 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 Celebrate. Amen. Celebrate. And his lovely wife. And as I do that, I remember Gideon. Gideon. When you think about Gideon, just give you a thought and uh, find uh, First Peter chapter one while you while I'm talking about this. When you think about Gideon, Gideon had thirty-two thousand men, and when you walk up the hillside and you look in the valley, the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east were like grasshoppers for multitude and the cavalry riders were without number. Well, you know that every number terminates. So what they were saying was the amount of people that were down there, there was no way for them to do the census to count the enemy. And with 32,000 men, the Lord said, you have too many folk. You got too many with you. He said, I tell you what you do, you tell all the folk that are afraid that they can leave. And 20 plus thousand said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and they took off. He said, you got some coward folk with you. That no matter what your vision is, they're too afraid to tackle it. I don't think we can do that. That's never been done before. And then he said, now I want you to tell all the others to go down to the brook and see how they drink. If you got from that. He said, don't get those. Get the ones who get down on their knees and lap it up like dogs. See, you have coward folk with you. And then you got proud folk with you. And so you got to get rid of the proud and the cowardly. Now he's left now with less than 1% of the original number. And God says, now you've got what I want. Now remember, Gideon was extraordinarily humble. Because he said, I'm the least, why am I going? So he was not a proud fellow at all. But here's what he said to Israel. He said, when you strike the enemy, I want you to strike the enemy by saying the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. The two names you got to remember in grace in this house. You got to remember the name of your Lord and the name of your leader. When you strike the enemy, you strike him in the name of your Lord and the name of your leader. What's the name of your Lord? Jesus. Do we need to rehearse that? No. What's the name of your Lord? Jesus. And the name of your leader? Prophet EJ. All right. God bless you. I think we got it. In 1 Peter chapter 1, and beginning to read at verse 1 through and including verse 5. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, 
Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day. Wherein ye greatly rejoice through now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations at the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. I want you to look at somebody like, you ang like you're angry with them. Look, look as mean as you can get. And tell them hope for the best. Hope for the best. You got a reason to hope for the best. It's interesting that you might have noted, and uh, I can I can either teach this or I can preach it. I can holler and scream and run up and down, and have the organ come in, and so I I just. Play it by air. If you notice, he said that he was writing to some strangers. And the question now relates to any contextual analysis. What is he speaking about when he talks about strangers? He's talking to a group of people who understand that if you're operating in a spiritual matrix, if there's anything spiritual about you, then you are not actually now made for this world. So because of that spiritual connection, he regards them as people who don't really belong passing through. There is an attitude then that all of us must understand and that is when you're chosen by God you don't fit the norm. And you have to be ready for those people who don't understand that having God in your life in a world that is for the most part, wicked and despicable, you don't always fall within the place where people like you. And I've got news for you, that happens even when you're gifted. <laughs> and I'll tell you this, if you have no haters, you're not that gifted. He outlines then the responsibility of God actually towards the sinner. And he now is going to explain how God makes strangers out of people in their own land. And what he does is he deals primarily with the dynamics of selection. 
Because if you're sitting here today and you have any relationship with God, you didn't choose him. He chose you. And I think it's important to understand that because what it does is it takes the responsibility for my salvation out of my hands. It is, I didn't choose God. He chose me. I don't want to get too, uh, I don't want to get too difficult with this. But when I use the word chosen, it's actually an anthropomorphic term. And when you say anthropomorphic, it's simply dealing with uh, somewhere there, there's man. And it's a term that gives us an understanding about what happens in heaven that really didn't happen. with me. It's an anthropomorphic term uh, like streets of gold, which is given an indication to man that uh, the heavenly environment is beautiful, but if you're looking for earthly gold there, then you've missed the point. He's simply trying to explain in human terms what is marvelous in a heavenly environment. But when you look at the word chosen, it didn't really happen. And here's why. There are two things about God that we have to bring together to understand how it's simply anthropomorphic and not a reality. And the first one is that God is eternal. And if he's eternal, then he has no beginning and he has no ending. I tell this antidote wherever I go, and that is when I was a little boy and I heard my father say that God had no beginning. I would say to him, well, if he has no beginning and I go into his past and I keep going and going and going and going and going and going and I can't find a starting point, then how did he ever get to right now? I keep going and going and going and going and going and I can't find where he began. Then how did he get to right now? What I discovered then as I matured was that I am using time to describe eternity. And time and eternity are completely antithetical because there is no past in God. There is no future in God. God is an ever-present now. Which means then that he has no beginning. But then when you couple that with another one of his attributes, and that's omniscience, then that means he knows all things at all quote-unquote time. So there is nothing then that you can teach God because God knows all things. But when did he know all things? From his beginning. But he has no. So he always existed, and he always knew all things. So when did he choose? Uh, should I take that, or should I go over that again? Go deeper. He's an eternal God, but he's an omniscient God. So there was never, quote unquote, a time, and I say quote unquote time because I'm inserting time in an environment where there is no time. But in order to be anthropomorphic, we have to use the expression of time to see can we get this across. 
God always knew himself. And he always knew you. So there was never a time in the existence of God that you were out of his mind. So I don't know why you're worrying about the devil. He created the devil after he knew you. Amen. Yo, sit down. I got some work done. So Peter then understands the dynamics of selection. And when he deals, no, I had it ready. <laughs> when he deals with the dynamics of selection, he understands that out of all of Israel, he chose 12. He chose those that he wanted to follow him out of all of Israel. It is not that they were particularly better than anyone else. It was simply his right to choose. I have heard him say, particularly to the man, the centurion, he said to him and declared, when he said, just send the word, he said, I've never seen such faith. Not in all of Israel. And I imagine when he was saying that, he was looking at his disciples. But yet still, he never got rid of any of them for anybody else. And he extolled the virtues of other people's faith, but they weren't his choice. I don't know, have you ever dealt with the dynamics of being chosen? And understand how simply being chosen elevates your self-esteem. A hundred people go out to get a job and you were one of the hundred. And it's a job that everybody seriously wants. And yet still of the hundred, they only needed five. And you look at others with resumes that seem to be more significant than yours. And yet still you were the one chosen. Oh, I feel like shouting on that. Oh, he's the most popular guy in town. He's debonair and suave. Oh, yes. He is the cat's meow and the dog's bow wow. And everybody in town wanted to go out with him. But you were the one chosen. Now in the human arena to be chosen elevates your significance. But if you're living in this world and God decides that he's going to choose you out of everybody in your family or choose you out of the people that are around you, then I guarantee you, you were designated for a blessing that nobody can take from you, that nobody can give you. And I think every now and then, when you fall on your knees and you feel the presence of God, you ought to throw your hands up and say, Lord, I thank you for having chosen me before the foundation of the world. And I can look the devil in the face and say, you can't touch me because God has chosen me. He's chosen who I am. It is significant then that Peter is saying that I don't have to say I need a chance because God gave it to me and when he chose me, he chose me with an inheritance. So where Petros begins is the recipients of the letter are called the elect. And they're the elect from El Lego to pick out or to select from out of a number. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, chosen refers then to the act of God in sovereign grace choosing out of certain 
of, from among mankind for himself. He didn't choose you to be who you want to be. He chose you to be who he wants you to be. The verb then is in the middle voice. And in the middle voice, it's speaking of the subject acting in his own interest. That's why you've got to understand how God can set up situations for his glory. And if you consider, if I may just digress for a minute, consider Lazarus, how he stayed away until Lazarus died. Consider Abraham, he made him a promise. And then he waited 25 years until Abraham was 100 years old and his wife was 90 years old before he released the promise. You see, what God does oftentimes is he sets up situations in order to get glory because he didn't choose you for you. He chose you for himself. Ah, I feel like shouting here. And what he does then is he sets up situations in order to give revelation so that he might get the glory out of your life. Oh, you think the car you drive is for you. The car you drive is for the glory of God. You think the person you have with you is for you. The person you have with you is for the glory of God. If God gives you anything and puts you in any position, he's not doing it simply for you. He's doing it for his glory. That's why he'll call you when it's difficult. He'll wait until it's impossible and then he'll bring the miracle for his glory. Oh, I feel like shouting here. So it's Peter's then. The first step is the dynamics of choice. The second step he outlines for us is through sanctification of the spirit unto obedience. Now what he's saying here in the text is, and it's clear in the Greek, that it is the Holy Spirit that does the sanctifying. Now most of us, when we think of sanctifying, we think of being clean. But the truth is, that's not what it means in the Greek. In this particular text, it means that he sets something apart. And from the Greek language, that would be what we call location of sphere. And that is God moves in and he sets something apart. Now, I went to the Kmart the other day and I bought some glasses. And out of the, yeah, well, you know, it's my example. And I bought some glasses. When I bought the glasses, I selected certain glasses in and out of the Kmart and those glasses are set apart from the rest of the glasses for my use. The glasses that I use that I have set apart they are not always clean but they're always mine. Whoever God has set apart for himself isn't always clean, but they're always his. Ah, and as long as you're his, he'll clean you up. Ah, I feel like shouting. It is critical then because it is the Holy Spirit. Uh, y'all rest, y'all rest, y'all rest. It is the Holy Spirit that now makes and draws the individual. It is the Holy Spirit that sets you apart. So the father, if you notice the text, the father chooses the sinner out of mankind. And then he chooses them to be a recipient of the setting apart through and by the Holy Spirit. In which now the Holy Spirit takes the sinner and sets him apart from his unbelief to the act of believing in faith 
faith in the Lord Jesus. This act of faith is obedience, which is not obedience of the saint, but of the sinner to faith. The act is answered by the sinner being cleansed through the precious blood of Christ Jesus. So what you have here is God operating as Father, God operating as the Holy Spirit, and God operating as the Son, which means that the Godhead had a C-O-U-N-C-I-L to come up with a C-O-U-N. S-E-L. Can I go over that? It is the meeting of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, where the Father, who is God, and the Son, who is God, and the Holy Spirit, who is God, had a meeting. It decided that God would do the choosing. The Holy Spirit would do the separating, and the Son would do the cleansing. So you've got the operation of the Godhead in your favor. And if the almighty God is in your favor, then who can be against you? Ah, oh, there is no devil in hell that can stop God from making you what he set out to make you and you will become what God wants you to be. He'll take you up he'll take you down he'll take you through he'll take you under he'll take you out he'll take you in but before it's over your life is going to glorify yeah, I'm almost there. Yeah. it is critical because Peter uses the phraseology and typology of the heretical ritual where the priest sprinkles the people with the sacrificial blood and here he manifests the total operation of God for the benefit of who he has chosen the third step is indicative of the first and the second and he operates now in the power of grace and when you look at grace it is so rich because it is a study of its own when you talk about grace you see what God has appraised each one of us from the point of view that none of us come to the table in a covenant relationship with anything but weakness what can God really count on you to do outside of his own power anytime we have approached him we have all approached him in weakness uh-huh 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 oh yes oh yes you might feel pretty good about where you are now and you might feel pretty good about what you have become but if you walked in here today and you were not caught by the police for some negative thing and if you are here and you're living a real good life it's not because of you it's because of him oh I've got news for you the only thing we could bring to the table is weakness and if you took through the old testament you will find that every group of people failed in every dispensation in every covenant relationship with God man failed so God said I tell you how I'll fix it I'm going to fix it so I can have a relationship with the people I choose and I'm going to use their weakness as a part of the bargain since all you're going to bring me is weakness then I'll make weakness a requirement for your salvation and we call that grace like preaching uh, grace is not pay I don't care how good you think you are you cannot approach God with I deserve I deserve this house I deserve this car can, can I preach like I feel it I'm, I'm about to go ethnic uh, I'm about to go ethnic but I'll hold for a minute there is absolutely no way for you to approach God and put up a record. There's no way for you to approach God like the Pharisee and say, I'm not as 
other men are. Yes, you are, you ugly thing. You just like everybody else, if not worse. You're worse because you're proud. You're worse because you want to compare yourself with other people. If you want to compare yourself with somebody, I dare you to compare yourself with Jesus. <laughs> because other people really don't matter when you have a relationship with Jesus. You can't approach him. Sometimes we don't approach God with the boldness that we should because we don't feel like we deserve. Well, nobody deserves. You got to approach him understanding that you don't deserve, but understanding that he has chosen you. I, oh, I didn't choose him. He chose me. Uh, can I preach like I feel it? I, uh, are you still with me? Yeah. You see, one of the things about being chosen by God and one of the things about him making you promises. I have been minding my own business and all of a sudden you come in my life and you start making me promises. I didn't ask you for any of it. I didn't, I didn't go out of my way to solicit you to give me any promise. You just saw me. You just disturbed me my life because promises disturb lives uh, can, can I preach like I feel it you see if I and um, you said it, it goes like this you're sitting at home and you want to come over to grace and a friend of yours calls you and says I'm going to grace tonight I'm going to hear the prophet and I'm going to church and you say yeah I've been thinking about going and they say they're coming to pick you up well three others of your friends have called and when they call and said we're going to church do you want us to pick you up and here's what you'll say I have a right uh -huh. I have a right you turn down three people who were coming and you fact that you had a right and then the ride that you said you have doesn't show up and then they don't understand why you go off on them because you miss the service the truth is you didn't have a ride you had a promise but the promise changed your life to the point where you turn down some other folk. God is not like man. If he tells you I'm going to do it, he's going to bring it to pass because I disturbed your life with a promise and I keep my promises. Uh, have I told you touch your neighbor yet? Uh, it's on the way. It's on the way. It's a critical thing to understand this. That he knows then that the third step is indicative of the first. And the second because of grace. And peace then is produced by the heart in the spirit filled saint. Because now I have the manifestation of God on all levels. And then he moves to what the Greeks call a eulogy. He says now bless it. And that is to praise, to celebrate with praises. When I understand that I am chosen, when I understand it's by grace and it's not by my own merit, but by the power of God, then it brings me then to the only thing that I can do and that celebrate with praises. I can only speak to God of things well done to bless is to speak well of that the redeemed of the Lord ought to say so and when God has brought you out of darkness into marvelous light and has blessed you in spite of yourself you ought to talk about it you ought to praise him can I can I just take you there you know prayer there's no way for you to pray and not praise before you ask for anything you can't walk into the presence of the almighty God and see the beauty of him 
Isaiah said I saw him high and lifted up with train they flew with train they covered their eyes and with train they covered their feet and they said holy 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 sometimes you walk into the presence I sometimes go to my wife to get something from her but then she's decked out in some decadent looking outfit and I need her to go get me some water but when I walk up and see her decked up and looking like she's looking I have to stop for a moment and praise the way she looks and then I remember that I didn't come just to praise but I need some water there's no way for you to approach God in the splendiferous magnanimity of his beauty and not give him some glory Lord I need a car but you look good Lord I need a house but you look good and before I ask you for anything I gotta tell you just how wonderful you look to me I will bless the Lord at all Oh, I'm almost there. I feel a church coming on. Give somebody a high five for the first time. Say, neighbor, I will bless the Lord at all times. Uh, he's worthy of our praises. The saints grow quicker. The saints grow quicker spiritually by giving this sacrificial praise to the Lord's service than in receiving spiritual ministrations of others. This is why the writer says to receive is perfectly proper and is needed. But a sponge like absorption alone is not conducive to a healthy growth in the Christian life. Because once God moves you, having chosen you, having bestowed you with grace and with promises he expects you to infect the people around you and to touch people with the blessings that he has given one writer puts it like this and I quote he says Christian character is developed not by one's knowledge of the word of God but by putting it in to practice what one knows of the word of God he continues spiritual prosperity is not dependent upon what one takes in of the word but upon what one gives out of himself in service of the Lord Jesus as one obeys the word that's why Peter says you gotta eulogize him Peter then speaks of the God of Israel as the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ thus he recognizes his human relationship to God the Father recognizing our Lord in his incarnate state incarnate rather state and worships him as God himself yet I look at Peter's life and I see where Peter's coming from and every now and then the thing you go through makes you more powerful for what God wants to do with you He's got to take you through certain experiences to bring you from yourself into his self. He's got to take you from thinking you're all that. Can I preach like I feel it? You see, you can be so blessed that you get beside yourself because some people have gotten used to the blessings and would rather have the gift than the giver. But you see, God can bless you so well that the gift threatens how you feel about the giver that's why every now and then he sends a job experience in order for you to understand it ain't about the car it ain't about 
the house. It's not about the man or the woman. It's about the God who gave them. Every time you look at somebody you love, who loves you in return. Can I preach like I feel it? Can I preach like I feel it? Give somebody a high five for the second time and say, neighbor, you need somebody that God can use to love you. That God wants to love you through somebody. And when you know it's God, you give God the glory for loving you through somebody and not loving them for themselves. And when you love them like that, when you can lift him up like that, then everything in your life does not exclude God, but it includes God. I thank God for my degree. I thank God for my pedigree. I thank God for my creativity. I thank God for my intellectuality. I thank God for my house. I thank God for my car. But I got news for you. If you take my car, leave me with God. If you take my house, leave me with God. If you take my job, leave me with God. Because I'm not going to lose my mind if I lose my job. Because I'm going to need my mind for the business I should have started. I feel like, I feel like uh, Y'all excuse me. Y'all sit down a minute. I, I'm almost through. <laughs> and so now he recognized our Lord in the incarnate state and Jehovah and Savior and Christ the anointed one and so hath begotten is the Arius participle which refers to an act that was done once that is always happening he didn't give you new life and it stopped he gave you new life then and the life is always continuing so here's what I have I have a reason to hope and it's not a dead hope it's a lively hope so every day I move I move with expectation come on wise we might as well have church every time I move I move with expectation because you can't have faith if you don't have hope for hope faith is the substance the hypostasis of things hoped for it is the eloquence of things not seen I walk in hope I walk in expectation so you can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him you can't make me feel as if it's not coming to pass because I'm stepping on the promises that God gave me and God is not a promiser who does not keep his word I want to preach to somebody here that's been waiting on it give some money high five and say if you know God said it then wait on it expect it to happen every day I feel like lifting him up can I preach like I feel it can I preach like I want to I need five people run up here real quick come on up here real quick I need to get some help from somebody I'm getting ready to close I'm an object of God's care and I'm object of God's love and I have a right to look for the best that's coming in my life I want you to face that way face that way you've got to understand this as I talk to you young people that there is no seniority in God if you know how to expect it and if you know how to look for it you don't have to be around for a long time you just have to know the right time and the right time is when you can praise God in spite
spite of what you're going through you don't wait complaining you don't wait arguing you don't wait finding excuse you just wait praising the name of the Lord sometimes you think you gotta get in touch with certain people in order to get in touch with God but there is only one mediator between man and God and that's a man Christ Jesus I'm expecting a miracle I'm expecting a blessing I didn't come out here tonight just to see what you were wearing but I came out with my mind made up that I'm not leaving here without my blessing I got a blessing I got a blessing in this house can I preach like I feel it give somebody a high five for the fourth time and say neighbor there is a blessing in this house for you right now do you expect it do you believe it are you ready for it I'm ready I'm ready you got some folk think they need to hook up with certain folk in order to get a blessing but there is no seniority in God every now and then the first turnaround all of a sudden the first is the last and the last Give somebody a high five for the second to the last time and say, neighbor, God is getting ready to turn the line. I'm so glad I can hope, hope, hope. I expect my blessing. I expect my anointing. I expect my giftedness. It didn't happen yesterday, but it's going to happen right now. And I'm going to praise Him. God bless you tonight. Give some money high five for the last time. Say so it's getting ready, Get ready to happen in your life. Expect it, receive it, hold it, give God glory. It's already. It's already done. It's already done. Before the foundation of the world, he chose, selected, promised, sanctify so I'm a lively hope I'm a living hope and when people look at you and can't understand when they look at your circumstance and they wonder how can you be in that situation with that kind of buoyance and that kind of expectation because I don't live by situation. I live by revelation. That in spite of how it looks, God chose me. And because he's a God of excellence, I expect I expect the best. 
And it is in that expectation that hope troubles the present. It destroys how you feel about the present. Because I have a promise. And I expect God to deliver in his word. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweet refrain, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand. Oh, the ground is sinking sand. Oh, the ground is sinking sand. We are jubilant tonight, but I sense in my spirit there is someone in here who has been on the edge at that point where you're even beginning to wonder, did God say it? And he sent this word to pull you back into that place of confidence. And what he wants you to understand is that your anchor holds and it grips that solid rock. Where is that anchor? The anchor is in the veil where the high priest is Jesus and if you know anything about that Old Testament issue they put bells on the priest and they had a rope around his waist because if he fell dead nobody nobody could go in they had to drag him out when they didn't hear the bells that is a type of the heavenly third heaven. That's a type of the heavenly place where Jesus is making intercession. That's just a type. The Hebrew writer says, your anchor is fastened in there. That means there is no devil that can go in there and loose that anchor. So to that person who is on the edge, I say to you tonight, renew your thoughts about God because he will never let you down. He will never miss. And if you're going through anything tonight, he's just strengthening you for what he's getting ready to do for you. I want you to take one person by both hands. Get a prayer partner. One person by both hands. You're holding a binding hand and a loosing hand. He said to whatsoever we bind on earth. I'll bind in heaven. Now notice he didn't say what I bind, you bind. He said what you bind, I will bind. What you lose, I'll lose. Squeeze one hand. In the name of Jesus, I bind depression. I bind every demonic spirit that has oppressed my brother, my sister. I bind sadness. I bind low self-esteem. I bind fear in the name of Jesus I bind fear right now I bind every negative thought every negative word that has rested on the mind of my brother I bind it right now I bind it in the name of Jesus I bind whispering and slandering I bind haters venom I bind maliciousness 
I bind it in the name of Jesus. I bind conspiracies. I bind threatenings in the name of Jesus. Now squeeze the other hand. I lose her joy. I lose power. I lose anointing. I lose high and lift it up. I lose faith right now. I lose every gift. I lose everything that you have promised. I lose every material, every spiritual, every psychological. I lose it right now. I lose you right now. I lose you. I lose your praise. I lose your power. I lose your joy. And if you believe God, lose those hands. Give God the glory. Give God the praise. It's done. It's done. It's done. If you haven't been born again, I cannot stop without calling for somebody who does not know the Lord as Savior to come out of your seat and come this way. Every one of us had to do it. So come, come. every head bowed in this building as you pray for somebody to give in to the drawing of the Lord for I feel him drawing right now I feel him drawing right now prophetess bishop Somebody. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. And adore you. I want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. Come on, say it with us. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Father, I worship. Lift your hands in the room as we pray. Father, I love you. I love you more than anything. Come on, let's pray while she's praying. I love you, Jesus. If you're in agreement, lift your hands. I worship you. I just want to just want to tell you. Father, we love you. Father, we love you more than anything. Say it again with us. I love you. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Come on, keep those hands lifted while she's praying. I worship. I worship and Father, we want to. Just want to tell you. Father, that we love you. Come on, if you're loving, lift your hands. Father, we love you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you. Give the Lord another praise in his house.